What's up my common comrades, back in 2019, DC and writer Tom Taylor introduced an epic multi-part story titled Deceased. It was so good that we covered every issue of the main story here on the channel. So over the next few weeks, we're gonna bring you guys several episodes highlighting each major story arc in the series, starting today with the original six issue series and the single issue tie-in called A Good Day to Die. So let's not waste any time and dive in with issue one. On with the show. The comic opens up with Superman having just broken Darkseid's jaw and the Just League defeating Darkseid yet again after a long, grueling battle. Superman says, you'll leave Earth, Darkseid, now. Batman then says, you will not return to our world, with Wonder Woman following up saying, the lasso of truth compels you. Then Darkseid replies, I will not return. I have no need. For the truth is, I have what I came for. As he tears off Wonder Woman's lasso and throws it to the ground in a mic drop moment while returning to Apocalypse. We then learn that Cyborg is missing via Batman as Batman secretly has a tracker on everyone in the Justice League without them knowing, because Batman. Of course, this raises some concerns with the League, but they didn't have time to get into it with Batman. We are then taken to Apocalypse where we see what Darkseid came to Earth for. It was Cyborg. And one of Darkseid's elite, the sadistic torturer Dasad, has essentially crucified Cyborg to an apocalyptic type torturing table. We then find out the reason for Cyborg's abduction. Dasad tells Cyborg that the almighty Darkseid already has half of the anti-life equation, but the other half had manifested on Earth, which he found. Cyborg asks where, and Darkseid walks in saying, in you. Long story short, Dasad tells Darkseid Cyborg won't survive the extraction, so he calls upon Death, aka the Black Racer, to essentially prolong Cyborg's death to get the piece of the anti-life equation he needs. But Death corrupted and changed the equation, turning it into something else. Something horrific and deadly. Something that infected Darkseid and made him go crazy, clawing off his freaking face. Dasad then sends the now infected Cyborg back to Earth to try to get rid of the problem, but it was too late. Darkseid starts going crazy and jumps into Apocalypse's core, unleashing all of his power, destroying himself and all of Apocalypse. After this, we see Cyborg return to Earth, and once he does, his system was automatically online, and the anti-life equation leaped from him, patient zero, to the internet. Cyborg tried to firewall himself, cutting himself off from the world, but it was too late and the damage was done. And this is where we get an explanation of what exactly is going on. We learn that the anti-life equation began to spread as a techno-organic virus that attacked through social media as a disease that bridged the digital divide to the biological and infected the minds of all who saw it. And once infected, they would mindlessly share messages and tweet the equation, spreading it even more. The equation made people desperate and scared, so they tried to tear the equation from their heads which is why everyone infected starts clawing off their faces before they're eventually enslaved by the equation. Meanwhile, Superman is talking to Mr. Miracle and Big Barda at their home, but having super hearing, he hears screaming from the city. So he flies off to see what's going on, only to find out the world is tearing itself apart. So of course, he immediately flies home to his apartment to warn Lois and John of this techno-organic virus. We are then thrown to Batman in his Batcave, who of course has the virus quarantined and all of his firewalls in place on his back computers, because again, Batman. He then runs diagnostics on how many people are infected, and we find out it's 600 million worldwide, and that at the current rapid rate, the virus will spread to almost every internet connected device within days, infecting billions. Batman then realizes the internet connection hasn't been disabled in his mansion, only the Batcave. So when he goes to check on Alfred, he sees that Nightwing has been infected and is trying to tear Alfred and Bruce apart. But it gets worse because he also sees that Tim Drake has been infected and he tears a chunk out of Batman's arm. But it gets even crazier than that because the final page of the comic shows Nightwing biting a piece of Batman's neck off. The second issue then picks up with Aquaman discovering an empty cargo ship in the North Atlantic Ocean. But he soon finds out the ship isn't empty and is infested with infected people who start attacking him, pushing him overboard into the water. We then see Metropolis on fire as Damian Wayne and Jonathan Kent look from a distance, and we also find out that Superman needs to go to Smallville to check on his parents. But Lois wants to go to the Daily Planet first. Then we get a scene where Harley is getting a pep talk from Ivy before she goes in to break up with the Joker. But when Harley goes in to dump Mr. J, we find out before he turns around that he's infected too. The comic then jumps to outside of Metropolis where we see Black Canary, Green Arrow, and Hal Jordan, Green Lantern camping. Anyway, we find out that Hal Jordan hates camping, so he ends up turning in early, going to his tent where he looks at his phone. And we know what that leads to. He becomes infected, blows up his tent with his ring, and starts attacking Green Arrow and Black Canary. So much so, it forces Black Canary's hand to use such an intense canary cry against him that it kills him in the process. Oliver is like, what did you do? Then the Green Lantern ring says, Green Lantern of Sector 2814, deceased, scanning for replacement. Replacement found, Diana Lance of Earth, you have the ability to overcome great fear. Welcome to the Green Lantern Corps. But skipping some stuff here and there, we are eventually brought back to Batman in the Batcave, 
who had put on one of Mr. Freeze's old suits to slow down his metabolism, which in turn slows down the spread of the virus within him. He then tells Superman, even though I slowed it down, the infection is soon gonna take over. He goes on to tell Superman, there's literally no time for sentiment, Clark. It's a technological biological hybrid that could be transferred through blood and through digital imagery. To save the world, you're gonna have to destroy any human carriers and you're gonna have to take down the internet. After this, Batman goes on to tell his son Damien that he left something for him with Alfred which is a briefcase that has the bat symbol on it, which we could only assume is a bat suit, having his son carry on his mantle. And right as Bruce is starting to give a sentimental speech to his son, he starts changing, clawing at his face, tearing off his helmet from the free suit. He then turns around to start attacking Alfred, but Alfred, who's been holding a shotgun this whole time, knowing what's inevitably gonna happen, says, computer, cease transmission. So Damien didn't have to hear what was about to happen. Alfred then says, it shouldn't have ended this way. Not for you. I'm sorry, son. And then bang. Alfred kills Bruce. And issue three gets even more gut-wrenching as it literally opens up with Alfred looking at Dick Grayson, Tim Drake's, and Bruce's dead bloody bodies with him saying, my boys, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I couldn't save you. So Alfred hops into the Batwing with a briefcase Bruce gave him to give to Damien and on the way to Damien starts mowing down infected zombie people to let out some anger and frustration. Alfred's a freaking boss. We are then thrown back to Harley and the Joker, where we see Joker attacking her, but she quickly gets a hold of the situation by killing him with a shotgun blast to the stomach. Unfortunately, after this, zombie birds of prey show up and start attacking her, but she just says, I guess we're bird hunting. Gotta love Harley. We are then shown that Aquaman is infected from being attacked in the previous issue and is now going after Atlantis. Jumping forward again, we see that Superman finally arrives home in Smallville to check on his parents. He quickly sees his mother and says, Ma, where's Pa? She tells him he's... Jonathan's inside. I hit him, Clark. He fell. Letting us already know, Soup's dad is infected. We then see Superman walking slowly inside the barn where his dad is locked in an underground basement. So Superman breaks the locks and opens the door to reveal his zombie infected father running out, starting to attack him. Superman being Superman easily, but sadly just dodges and deflects his dad's attacks and catches his father's arms like it was nothing, slowly and sadly walking his dad down into the basement and then closing the door. Once the door is closed, he uses his heat vision to blast a beam through the door and kill his father. Then when he walks out of the barn, his mom looks at him like what happened while saying Clark, but he just said, it's time to go. And she says, we can't just leave. This is our home your father. And he replies, he isn't here, Ma. He isn't here. Talk about another gut-wrenching moment. Just completely nuts. Not only was Alfred forced to kill Bruce, having a father kill his son, in the next issue, Superman is forced to kill Jonathan, having a son kill his father. But before we move on to issue four, I gotta ask, have you seen the trailer for the upcoming Penguin series? It looks amazing. He was without a doubt the best part of the Batman movie. But Colin Farrell has some big shoes to fill because Danny DeVito's Penguin in Batman Returns was iconic. Which is why we're stupid excited about today's sponsor, Pure Arts, and their Batman cowl and penguin art mask. The hyper-realistic 1-1 scale penguin art mask exclusive edition is just insane. It has textured silicone skin, individually punched hair, features removable monocle, top hat, cravat and cigarette holder, and has an exclusive mini duck boat replica in resin. It's one of the coolest busts I've ever seen. They only have 100 exclusive editions, and we are out of our mind excited to have one here in the variant studio. But every villain has their hero, and you've got to check out this Batman 1-1 scale cowl replica. You guys wouldn't believe how film accurate this thing is. And that's because Pure Arts owns one of the actual prop cowls used in the 1989 Tim Burton film worn by Michael Keaton. And they use 3D scans to create the most realistic and movie accurate physical cowl replica on the market. It's absolutely next level and something you need to see in person. They even developed their own poly hybrid mixed media material for accurate prop textures and feel without the risk of deterioration over time. And to top it off, this collectible cowl also comes with a miniature Gotham City mayoral house statue base and removable emblem. It's just nuts. Both are officially licensed by DC Comics and Warner Brothers, so if you're a Keaton Batman fan, you need this Batman cowl replica and Penguin Art Mask Exclusive Edition. You can grab yours at purearts.com forward slash variant, and when you use our code variant, you'll get an additional 5% off both products. I'm telling you, these are unreal collectibles you don't want to miss. Just click our link in the description below. But now let's get back to the deceased miniseries. Issue 4 opens up with Amanda Waller and Captain Adam in Cadmus Deep Underground, waiting on Ray Palmer aka the Adam. Palmer has shrunken down and went into someone who's infected to see if he could somehow reverse engineer and or stop the virus from spreading. And while they're waiting for him, it's taking Palmer longer than expected. And Waller's like, we can't wait for him any longer. 
Plague Protocol C has been ordered. And we find out that Protocol C is having Captain Adam go to the most affected areas and eradicate all life down to the very last atom, killing the infection. He doesn't want to, but he does and starts destroying those infected areas. If you're not aware, Captain Adam is essentially a living weapon. He's literally fueled by the quantum field. Anyway, while eradicating the infection, we see there's a problem with Captain Adam. Apparently, when Ray Palmer went inside of that infected woman, he too became infected, which is why he never came out of that woman. And instead, somehow found a way to microscopically get inside of Captain Adam and seize the heart of a living weapon. After this, we see Superman arrive back in Metropolis with his mom, breaking the news to Lois and John that his father is gone. We also see that the other heroes like Black Canary, Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and so on are on top of the Daily Planet still trying to get radio comms up so they could send a message to anyone out there who still isn't infected. And while they're doing this, Superman says, I need to leave again. I need to get back out there and help people. Then Black Canary says, we can't have you back out there. You're too great a threat if you were to be turned by seeing a screen. Superman replies, I won't. And Canary's like, how could you possibly know that? And Superman says, because I've been using my x-ray vision from the nanosecond, I worked out what was causing this. And that is one of the many reasons why Superman is a boss. After this, Lois and gang get the radio comms up and send a message out to the world saying, to all the uninfected, you are not alone. We are regrouping. The Justice League is gathering in Metropolis. Anyone with the power and means to get here, please get to the Daily Planet roof if it is safe and you are capable of doing so. After this, Superman and Black Canary Green Lantern go out looking for anyone they could help. And wouldn't you know it, they spot Flash and Kid Flash. Flash says, Bruce contacted us. We had to hide away from the world. Not very heroic, but if either one of us were to be infected, it would spell disaster. But Superman says, I can move you safely. We then get a pretty epic panel of Harley Quinn being attacked by Catwoman, Huntress, Batgirl, and Batwoman and she's holding them off with the shotgun until Poison Ivy steps in and crushes them into a bloody mess with her vines. We are then taken back to the rooftop of the Daily Planet, where Lois, Superboy, Robin, Green Arrow, and the others are hearing some pretty loud noises, and we see that it's an infected Giganta. And then Black Lightning says, that's a really big zombie. So they all start fighting her off, but out of nowhere, the Batwing shows up and starts firing missiles at her. After a few shots, she's able to punch it out of the air, but then Superman, Flash, Kid Flash, and Black Canary arrive just in time, with Canary catching the Batwing with a Green Lantern construct. Superman then knocks Giganta out by flying right into her face, after which Cyborg uses his arm cannon to blow a hole right through her head, killing her once and for all. Superman's like, Cyborg, what have you done? Cyborg explains, she wasn't alive. None of them are. We need to talk. After this, Damien runs towards what's left of the Batwing, yelling, Father! But Alfred gets out just saying, Damien, I'm sorry, son. He said you were worthy of it, that he was proud of you, and that he should have told you that every day, as he gives Damien the Batsuit. After this, Cyborg better explains to the heroes what exactly is going on, saying they're not zombies, they're a blight. An extension of the anti-life equation. The blighted ones want to spread death, nothing more. As he's explaining all this, the heroes see Hawkgirl fall out of the sky, but Wonder Woman catches her saying, what happened? And Hawkgirl replies, Captain Adam. He's turned, he's going to blow. And Superman says, where? So Wonder Woman and Superman head to DC. But when they get there, it's too late. As the comic says, it was the most destructive explosion ever unleashed on the world. It was heard and felt across the planet. Washington was gone in an instant and the blast kept growing. Baltimore crumbled and finally Metropolis did too. Okay, so that closes out issue four, which is where the tie-in story, A Good Day to Die, comes in. The issue starts off with Big Barda and Mr. Miracle boom tubing into Apocalypse as it's exploding with Big Barda telling Mr. Miracle, it's true, Apocalypse, the whole damn planet. Mr. Miracle replies, God is dead, as the caption says, a good day to die. Scott, aka Mr. Miracle, then tells Barda, Darkseid, the all-knowing, and he didn't know what he was doing? My father is gone, referring to his evil adopted father, Darkseid. Barda then asks, how do you feel? He replies, honestly, pretty good. And with that, she kisses him and then says, come on, we need to go back. We have to face what God unleashed on Earth. Back on Earth, we see Mr. Terrific has strapped an infected Captain Boomerang to his table in his lab, where he's performing tests on him to see what the heck this virus is doing and how it works. Mr. Terrific proceeds to voice record his findings saying, no noticeable change after secondary exposure to the virus. Deep analysis of the virus code shows no obvious flaws, and I'm hesitant to attempt any change for fear of corruption. I have 14 PhDs and I'm stumped, at which point one of his devices start beeping and he says, they're back. 
we go to the origin as he flies out of his lab. Meanwhile, elsewhere in an apartment building, we see Mr. Miracle and Barda staring at their apartment door as someone's knocking on it. They then stare at each other for a second before Barda goes to open the door. But Scott's like, whoa, what are you doing while grabbing her hand, stopping her? She then answers him saying, getting the door? He then says, how do you know it's not monsters? As they hear someone knock again. She then looks at him saying, I don't think the undead knock that politely. He then just looks at her annoyed saying, you don't know that's a knock. It might just sound like a knock. It could be a bloody stump smacking against the, and before he finishes his sentence, the doorbell rings. Varda then just looks at him saying, the bloody stump found the doorbell. At which point he looks at her pissed off saying, answer the door. When they open the door, we see it's Mr. Terrific. And Barda asks him, what are you doing here? He replies, I was tracking the planet for apocalyptic technology and got a spike. As he sits down, Scott comes to offer him a veggie plate. And Barda tells Mr. Terrific, Scott thought you were a bloody stump. Mr. Terrific starts to tell them, I've investigated the virus. It's apocalyptic at its core. Barda tells him, you've seen it? I thought that's how the infection was spreading. He answers her, the team mass protected me from the virus. Scott then jumps in saying, did you know it would do that? He answers, no. Scott then says, you're one of the smartest people in the world and you just got lucky? Mr. Terrific then tells him, yes. At this point, Mr. Terrific says, I was hoping you could take me to Apocalypse. If I could find exactly where this originated from, maybe I can. And Barda interrupts him saying, Apocalypse is gone. The whole planet is destroyed. Terrific then says, I see. Then we move on to other plans, to other destinations. As the comic takes us to Cord Industries. Inside, we see Booster Gold and Blue Beetle saying, the undead are right outside the door. And after they say this, the door blows open only for them to see Barda, Mr. Miracle, and Mr. Terrific fighting off the undead. Booster Gold then asks, you guys want some help? As we see Mr. Terrific's T-spheres flying through a bunch of undead, turning them into zombie Swiss cheese. Then on the next page, Barda says, no, I'd say we're good, as they destroyed all of the undead. Blue Beetle then says, it's good to see you, Barda. She replies, you too. I'd give you a hug, but I'm covered in a lot of undead bits. Mr. Miracle then jumps in saying, I have part of an ear in my tights. Booster Gold asks, what do you need? Barda answers, first, we need a shower. Then Mr. Terrific says, then we need to save the world. To do that, we need to think outside the box. Then on the next page, we see all of them are now on Blue Beetle's ship, the Blue Bug, flying over armies of the undead, while saying, it really is the end of the world, isn't it? Mr. Terrific answers, I'm hoping we still have a say in that, as they head to England. Booster Gold then asks, why not go to the Justice League? Terrific tells them, the Justice League is a powder keg. Do you really want to be nearby the anti-life equation if it gains the power of Wonder Woman. He continues to say the origin of the virus is gone. Our next option is magic. Blue Beetle speaks up saying magic is so unreliable. Terrific tells them there's a third option, but it could go very badly. Blue Beetle asks how badly? Terrific answers saying I prefer not to think about that yet. I don't want to risk all of time and space to see if it saves humanity. Then on the next page, we're taken to Liverpool where we see John Constantine running from an army of the undead in the city streets while yelling and cursing. It's actually hilarious. Then after this, we see he finally makes his way to his best friend and sidekick Chase as he tries to get into his taxi saying, Chase, start the car. Start the bloody, but as he looks in the front seat, he sees his best friend has been infected and said friend then starts attacking Constantine. Constantine sat and says, oh mate, I'm so sorry, as he says a spell that sets his friend on fire. With no time to mourn, Constantine jumps in the front seat and floors it to get away from the horde, but he crashes into another car saying, why didn't I ever learn how to drive? But remember, earlier we found out that Mr. Terrific and gang are headed to England, and that would be Liverpool, England, to find John Constantine. So of course, they eventually show up to help Constantine, and John says, oh, look at this, two misters and a big. Why can't you people get regular names? I mean, Mr. Terrific, what kind of Eric and Saad is comfortable walking around with that hanging around him? Why not just call yourself Mr. Full of Me Bloody Self and be done with it? After his little rant, Mr. Miracle asks, are you okay? And as Constantine gets out of the car, he says, Peachy, just set my best mate on fire and crashed his car while sitting on his ashes. How's your day going? Mr. Miracle replies, my entire planet was destroyed. John, while sitting on the hood of the car, says, all right, it's not a competition. John then asks, Mr. Terrific, how the heck did you find me? He answers, you have a Justice League membership in your wallet. It has a transponder inside of it. John goes, it has what? I thought it was like a library card. Terrific then says, John, I can't find a technological fix for this. I was hoping there could be a magic one. John answers, you think I could click my fingers and make all this go away? No, I already tried. This is beyond magic. This is find somewhere well stocked and enjoy what's left time. Terrific then asks, you're not gonna help? John tells him, I'm gonna hide and get so irresponsibly drunk I could barely feel anything. Care to join me? Terrific tells him, we have to save the world. John then says, right, off you pop and do that then. Before Barda, Mr. Miracle and Terrific leave, Terrific tells John, if you change your mind, you know where to find us. And John says, I won't. Then back on Blue Beetle's ship, Mr. Terrific says, it's time for that plan that risks all of time and space. He then asks, Booster, you have a time machine, right? He answers, kind of, I stole a time machine. Terrific asks, 
can you operate it? And Booster tells them, yes. So with that, they then head off to find it in Malibu, the home of fire and ice. But as they arrive, an infected fire causes Blue Beetle's ship to crash. So of course the heroes get out, and when they do, Big Barda tells Booster Gold and Blue Beetle to get to the house. Scott and I will hold them off. As of course, there's a horde of undead inside. Blue Beetle then asks, are you sure? Barda yells, go, as Mr. Miracle starts laying out the undead. But on the next page, we see that fire and ice and the army of the undead are starting to overwhelm Barda and Mr. Miracle. Miracle even falls, but Barda catches him and tells her, but if I could turn back time, if we could find a way, she then cuts him off saying, are your last words really gonna be quoting Cher? As he grabs her face saying, I like her, as both of them get overrun with the undead. Meanwhile, Booster Gold, Blue Beetle, and Mr. Terrific continue to make their way to the time machine. And when they get there, a voice says, Michael Carter. And Booster Gold then says, oh no. We then see that this voice is Wave Rider, who says, you will not be permitted to change time. Booster Gold then tells Blue Beetle, he's a master of time, and we're not getting past him. Meanwhile, in a pocket dimension at the Oblivion Bar, which is only accessible to powerful magic users, we see John Constantine about to get incredibly drunk. But before he starts drinking, he's just staring at the bottle, saying, bollocks as he gets up and leaves. The bartender then asks, where are you going? And he says, to be a damn hero. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Wave Rider tells Booster Gold he's arrested and the time machine is gonna be confiscated. But right after that, John Constantine shows up saying, take a good look, Sparkle Face. Now watch the hand closely. This is called misdirection as he headbutts Wave Rider. Mr. Terrific then says, I knew you'd come. And Constantine tells him, of course you did, Smarty Pants. Now do what you gotta do. I'll hold off shiny hair here. Right after he finishes his sentence, an infected Big Barda comes crashing through the wall, attacking Constantine but Mr. Terrific jumps in, kicking her off. Unfortunately for him, saving Constantine means sacrificing himself, as she proceeds to literally rip Mr. Terrific in two, throwing his upper torso aside as John Constantine yells, bloody hell. After this, Booster Gold tries to use the time machine, but he can't walk. He's becoming too weak. Blue Beetle asks, Wave Rider, what's happening? He tells them the end. Kal-El of Krypton has found Barry Allen on Earth in the rubble of Keystone City. Booster Gold then tells Blue Beetle, I think, I think we just lost the future. I don't think I was ever born. As Blue Beetle tries to help his friend, Booster just fades away into nothing. After this, things continue to go to hell as Big Barda infects Blue Beetle, and we see John Constantine use a magic spell to keep Wave Rider from running, which causes Blue Beetle to then slash Wave Rider's head off as an endless amount of undead start coming after John. But he's saved when Dr. Fate and Zatanna show up, with Fate saying, it's not your time. Another fate awaits you. John answers saying, another? Oh, you wanker, as he punched Fate's helmet, hurting his hand. Fate tells John, brute force cannot harm the helm. Also, it's made of metal, so you know, punching it is a bad idea to start with. John then says, I get a last second rescue, but actual heroes have to die. Dr. Fate tells John, I'm sorry, this was their fate. John says, oh, shut it. I'm not a big believer in destiny, mate. Takes all the human out of it. Fate proceeds to tell John, the world is ending, John. Constantine, we must prepare for what's coming next. The Lords of Order and Chaos, but John interrupts saying, can eat a giant bag of bullocks. The world isn't over until I say it is. And with that, the comic ends. This was an awesome tie-in and a great setup for the events in the Dead Planet series, which we'll bring to you in the next couple of weeks. In the meantime, let's continue the original series with issue five. The comic opens up with Superman and Wonder Woman just hovering in the sky, looking at the destruction. We then see a narration say, Superman, Wonder Woman, they've protected us so many times before, no matter how dark the day was. We saw them and new hope, but they couldn't protect us from this. Three cities were completely wiped out, Washington, Baltimore, and Metropolis. Millions of people were gone in an instant. But Black Canary Green Lantern was able to put a bubble around the roof of the Daily Planet, saving the few on top. Down below on the ground, Superman spots Lex Luthor, who wants to call a truce, saying, I'm not here to fight you, Superman. I'm not here to add to. And then Lex drops to his knees in despair, saying, look, look what happened to our city. It's definitely a side of Lex, we don't see much. We then see that over the next several days, the Just League took down the internet. Every major server in every country, every mass digital broadcasting device, everything we relied on was severed. So the only way for the virus to spread was through people. And if you haven't noticed yet, this story is definitely an allegory for how much we rely on tech and how it affects society. Anyway, after this, Wonder Woman convinces her people on Themyscira to let everyone use it as a sanctuary. So Superman, Wonder Woman, and Mira lifted sections of the seafloor and added to the landmass of Themyscira for the refugees of the world. We're then taken to Gotham where it grew into a jungle in a week and nothing penetrated its thorn-filled walls, obviously meaning it was protected by Poison Ivy. So Damien, now the new Batman, Black Canary, and Green Arrow go there to convince Ivy to take in some refugees. She doesn't want to at first, but Harley is able to convince her to do it. Then back at the Fortress of Solitude, we see that Cyborg and Luther were able to engineer closed communications, making the Fortress of Solitude a information hub, as well as a new hall for heroes. We find out that Cyborg and Lex Luthor have developed arcs that will fit seven million people 
but Superman's like, we're not leaving Earth. To which Luther says, Superman, I'm the most intelligent person on the planet. And then pauses and says, wait, is Batman dead? Cyborg says yes, and Lex goes on to say, right, then I'm the most intelligent person on the planet. And I'm telling you, the world is over. Lex goes on to say, it's inevitable. If the human race is to survive, it has to leave Earth. And Superman says, we're not abandoning this planet. We're fighting for it. Lex just says, losing two home worlds in one lifetime. How careless. Which pushes Lois to give him a right hook straight to the nose. Meanwhile, we see that the Justice League is starting to build the arcs, which pretty much just look like gigantic space blimps. But inside the Fortress of Solitude, all the heroes start hearing a loud buzz that turned into a scream. A scream in their minds. And all of a sudden, an infected Martian Manhunter comes out of nowhere ripping Lex Luthor in half and taking a chunk out of the Flash's hip. As the heroes are trying to fight him off, Firestorm tells everyone to move and fries Martian Manhunter as his weakness is fire. But as he's lying there all burnt, the heroes notice that the Flash is gone and Superman uses his vision to see that he's running. Kid Flash says, I'll get him. And Superman says, no, if you turn too, Wally, that could be bad. So Superman says, I'll go. Then Green Arrow's like, do you honestly think you can catch him? And Superman says, no, but I don't have to catch him. I can come from around the other side and meet him head on. Before he does so, he confirms with Cyborg that Flash is dead since he's infected. And once he does, he meets the Flash head on and literally blows right through him, causing the Flash to explode into a hundred pieces. It's all kinds of gory. But there's just one problem. When flying through the Flash, two of Flash's fingers stabbed Superman in the side as they collided at over the speed of light. Meaning Superman is now infected. How freaking crazy is that? Everybody's dying. But since Superman is Superman, the infection will take longer to spread with him. So with his remaining time, he says bye to Lois, his mother, and his son, as he knows he has to fly away as far as possible because once he's turned, he will be the world's greatest threat. And after those emotional goodbyes, Superman flies as far as he can to starve himself of oxygen before the virus could spread. And then on the last panel of the last page, we see him starting to turn with a caption saying, and any hope our world had was gone with him. And this, my friends, brings us to the sixth and final issue of the series. The very first panel of the first issue shows us a bloody Superman flying down to earth with a caption saying, faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. But Clark had a much greater power. Every single person who saw him was filled with hope. But all hope was lost on this day, as he flies straight down through the middle of the building, destroying it. Because now the beacon of hope is infected and bloodthirsty. Back at the Fortress of Solitude, Cyborg tells the heroes who are still not infected that if Superman is turned, that's it. It's over. The arcs are ready. We need to leave Earth. Now. Then Wonder Woman says, no, we need to take him on. And Black Lightning asks, how? And Damien says, with this. Bruce left him with a contingency takedown plan for every major hero. After this, there's a really funny beat with Green Arrow where he's offended that Bruce didn't leave a takedown plan for him. Canary's like, you're hurt that Batman didn't leave a post-mortem Machiavellian plan to end you? To which he says, well, yeah, I could be a planetary level threat if I wanted to. It's a really funny moment, one that keeps playing out through the book. We then find out that Bruce left Damien schematics on how to turn the kryptonite in his utility belt into a suppressing gas to slow down Superman. Wonder Woman's like, that's not enough. Bruce was a lot of things, but he was never lethal. It was admirable. She tells Cyborg and the others, Clark is vulnerable to kryptonite and magic. Years ago, my mother and I hypothesized we can join the two. So she takes the magical sword of Athena, the goddess of war, and infuses it with kryptonite. Meanwhile, the rest of the heroes and villains are getting as many people as they can on the arcs to get them away from Earth. But of course, nothing ever goes smoothly. And off the shores of Themyscira, a zombified Aquaman bursts out of the water on top of the freaking Kraken, along with an army of infected Atlanteans attacking Mera and the Amazons and everyone else who's on Paradise Island. And not shortly after, we see an arrow go right through Aquaman's head. And we see a panel of Green Arrow saying, and Batman didn't think I could be dangerous. I just fired an arrow half a mile through raging winds into the brain of the undead king of the sea while he was controlling the damn Kraken. But this doesn't stop an all-out war from happening between the living dead Atlanteans and the Amazons of Themyscira. Then we are thrown to the other side of the world where Green Lantern, Wonder Woman, and Cyborg are about to face off against Superman. Black Canary tries to hold him off by using a mixture of her Canary Cry and a Green Lantern construct of a megaphone. But that doesn't work for long, so Cyborg comes in for the assist, when ultimately Wonder Woman comes out of nowhere and cuts Superman's arm right off, and then stabs him right through the chest. But we just see that this pisses off zombie-infected Superman, and he punches a hole straight 
through her stomach. Cyborg then catches her and tells Canary that the virus started with him, and that he was never gonna go on the Ark, so he's staying with Wonder Woman. Back on the two Arks, which are now in space with millions of refugees, Superboy tells Damien that he's the only one who could stand against his father now, and even tells his mom, it's okay, I know what I have to do, as we get the iconic close-up of the S on his chest. Superboy leaves the Ark and ends up colliding head-on with his father, momentarily stunning the two, and just as Black Canary Green Lantern shows up to help, so does the entire Green Lantern Corps, which all I have to say is, it's about freaking time. Superman then looks at what seems to be an endless amount of Green Lanterns and decides it's not worth facing them and flies away. But the Guardians and the Green Lantern Corps chase him down. We find out that Superman retreated because he couldn't stand against the entire Green Lantern Corps, so he calculated another way to kill. And what's that way, you ask? Well, that would be him flying into the center of the sun, absorbing all of it, draining the sun itself. You know, the same sun that makes Superman Superman in the first place. We find this out when one of the Guardians say he's draining the entirety of the sun, so that once he does this, the solar system will grow cold and die. Canary's like, and we're just gonna let him do that? To which the Guardian says, even Green Lantern's light isn't powerful enough to reach into the heart of a star. Perhaps it's for the best. We cannot wipe out the virus directly. We cannot risk exposure. But if the system freezes, the virus will sleep. We will monitor the sun and your world, but it's time to move the survivors. Back on Earth, Cyborg puts the lasso of truth around Wonder Woman, saying the lasso of truth compels you. Can you speak? Wonder Woman replies, we have a voice. So Cyborg asks, is there a way to stop you? Are you a virus? Is there a cure? She replies, yes. And we find out the cure is Cyborg himself. Infected Wonder Woman says, you are man and machine. You are binary, off and on, patient zero, the alpha and the omega. So as he's about to tell the others on the Ark this revelation, she literally twists off his head and throws it in a canyon. After this, we are brought back to space where the Green Lantern Corps is escorting the Arks to find their new home. And the issue ends with Earth's heroes being shown their brand new Earth their Earth 2. But that wraps up the first complete six issue series in the deceased storyline. This is one of the best alternate universe stories DC has put out in years, so we're excited to relive all of it with you as we roll out the complete saga. But what about all of you? What are your favorite moments from this series? Let us know down in the comments. Otherwise, we'll see you next time when we talk all things comics.